That was on me. Good morning. I am making a note here so I don't forget something because I already forgot it once. A couple of announcements today. First of all, Wednesday is a really special day in the life of the church because Jeff Katie is having a birthday. Yay, Jeff. Uh, no, 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 because then you'll want to take up a collection and no. Look Up Center is in need of volunteers for their opportunity store during the week. If you're interested, there's a number in your bulletin to call. Um, and it's things like sorting through clothes and helping in the food pantry and, and various other um, tasks that they do. So I would ask you to consider that. Hey, Friday, October 14th, we're having our Friday night frenzy, uh, or as Debbie says, the Fellowship Potluck Dinner. And it's going to be down in the fireside room, and we're going to do something really exciting this time. We're going to have our charge conference there. I know you're all so excited about that. But actually, it's, it's not going to take long. So once we have the food, we'll go into a time of just, um, it shouldn't take more than 15 minutes, I'm hoping, uh, just to go over some church business. But I would invite you to that, and I'm going to try to come up with something uh, that we can do for Friday Night Frenzy that's a lot more fun than, than church business. But uh, we'll, we'll see where we end up on that. A uh, couple of thank yous. Um, thank you notes for your um, donations in Barney's memory to the... Um, uh, what is, um, Coalition of Care. Thank you. My mind went blank there for a second. And then Marcella and family and for Warren's memorial. And October 28th, if you're available during the day, it's a Friday morning at 10 o'clock. If you're available, the Montessori Academy down below us is going to use our parking lot for their trunk or treat. And I think it would be fun if we had a couple of cars, if people were available to pass out candy to the kids. If you have kids or grandkids that you'd like to bring, I think that'd be fine too. Uh, and have, have your grandkids dress up and, and, Jerry, no. You can pass out candy, you can dress up, but don't get in line for candy, okay? Goes to the kids. There's a prayer of Daniel, and, and this is in your bulletin. It's on the insert. It's below the Bible study questions. And this is one of Daniel's prayers um, in the book of Daniel. And I, I think this really speaks to us and in our society and where we are today. So I thought I'd put that in there. Did I miss anything? Cliff? Oh, yes. Work day. Uh, October 15th, Saturday. I'm going to say 9-ish, 10-ish. If you're available and you want to work, we're going to do some, I think, uh, painting. We're going to do some outside stuff, weather permitting, uh, general cleanup. The pews need a little bit of dusting and they need, I don't want, I don't want to use anything like a, a liquid gold with an oil base, but if there's something that we can use to uh, restore a little bit of the shine to the pews, maybe do some vacuuming, a little bit of deeper cleaning than we normally do. It's going to be around, like I said, 9.30 or 10 o'clock, something like that, uh, Saturday, October 15th. And it's a Saturday that Ohio State has a bye. So you're not going to miss any football, okay? Anything else? Debbie? Jeff? All right. I would invite you to stand for our call to worship. And let's praise God for, for who God is. This, uh, these words come to us from uh, the Old Testament book of Isaiah, chapter 42. The Lord is his name. Give glory to no other or praise to any idols, says the Lord. Sing to the Lord a new song. We will sing his praises from the ends of the earth. All who go down to the sea walk upon the land and live upon it. For too long we have kept quiet and held back. Those who praise idols will be turned back in shame. 
it pleases the Lord to make his law great and glorious for his righteousness. Those who do not praise him will cry out, but we will, he will not hear them. Praise God. Amen. And let's sing to God be the glory. To God be the glory, great things he hath done. So loved he the world that he gave us his Son, who yielded his life an atonement for sin, and opened the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory, great things he hath done. I think there's a lot. There's a lot on our plate to pray for uh, today. Uh, I don't know, um, beside the Cuban Missile Crisis, that we've ever been so close to worrying about complete nuclear war. Um, we've had hurricanes roar through the eastern coast Canada. We're trying to get some uh, sound issues resolved, so my apologies to you this morning. Um, I, I can't imagine a hurricane is something that people in Newfoundland would have to worry about, but yet that's the reality. And then just uh, Hurricane Ian that went through Florida and up through South Carolina and along the coast. Um, my goodness, what damage. Um, can't believe the pictures I've seen on, on TV. And then... The other one that just assaults my senses is reading that a road rage case in Chicago resulted in, in the death of a three-year-old child uh, shot. And I am at a loss. I can't explain anything. I don't have answers. I'm as confused as you are. I'm prayerful to God, but we want to lift those people in similar situations up in prayer. I'm anxious to hear what uh, is on your heart this morning, what you would like lifted up, and what praises you might have. Jerry? Yes. Yeah. At the, Jerry's mentioning the situation in Iran, and, and I, I think we're on the same page, but um, what I've been reading is about women who are just trying to get basic rights and, and their struggles, um, thinking of the people in Russia who are more sensible in trying to um, flee from an unjust um, ruler and, and what they must be going through. So there's a lot there to pray for. Yes, Ruth? Kenny? Ruth's brother-in-law, Kenny. We're going to lift him in prayer. Bonnie? Um, <clears throat> I don't know how many of you are aware, but uh, Ludie is in hospice care now, so we want to keep her lifted in prayer. And uh, I know she has a niece... Here, uh, are there other family members, Bonnie? So we want to keep Ludie lifted in prayer. She was uh, such a wonderful member of this church for such a long time, and um, I've missed her over these last couple of years. Other prayers? Debbie? Oh, good. Remind me her name. Marcy was, ha was in an automobile accident. It wasn't.
Okay, so Marcy, uh, not in an automobile accident, but fell through a trap door on a stage in a play that she was in. Um, well, was on our prayer list for uh, several weeks. Okay. She's not feeling well, but she's getting better. So, others, Jeff. Safe travels. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for um, those who are here today, and, and we're just so um, excited to be here and to be able to worship you and praise your holy name. Lord, we ask uh, your continued prayers for Kenny and Ludie and Marcy and safe travels. We pray that you would be so involved in the repairs and the uh, ongoing rescue effort uh, from various hurricanes. Lord, we pray that you would um, still the hands that control nuclear weapons in um, your will shall be accomplished, but Lord, um, we just pray for safety and for sanity in our world. We pray for families who all too often experience violence at the hands of others and uh, incidences of road rage and, and me first and shoot first, ask questions later. Lord, we don't understand that kind of thought process. So, Lord, we just pray your presence in all situations. Uh, make us, help us to become, encourage us to be your hands and feet. Lord, we ask all this in the precious name of Jesus Christ, who taught the disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I'm going to ask you to do something special here. I don't know that we've done this in a long time, but before we get to our doxology, I want you to kind of turn around and look up at Cliff, not at Cliff specifically, but the camera up there, and Walt and Marge do try to watch services when, the, uh, when they can get it, everything to work. Um, and Phyllis and Craig gener gener generally watch, easy for me to say, right, every Sunday, and Let's say hi to Phyllis and Craig. Turn around and look. Hi, Phyllis and Craig. And now, hi, Walter and Marge. I, I really miss them and, and all the others who are unable to be here, but um, saw them this week, and you know, Marge was doing well, and Walter's, he's hanging in. Um, Phyllis and Craig are, when I grow up, I want to be just like Craig and, and Phyllis. You keep an eye on that guy, okay? So thank you so much for humoring me with that. But I'd like us now to stand for our doxology. Lord, you are so generous to us. You take such wonderful care of us. We, all we are, all we have is a gift from you. We ask, Lord, that you would accept our gift of tithe and offering 
that those would be anointed by you and blessed and multiplied and, and carried around the world to serve others in your name, that they might all come to know Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. Amen. Please be seated. So we are getting ready to have a Friday night here in a little over a week and a half. And for those of you watching online, you uh, young folks, um, we're getting ready to have trunk or treat and things like that. I'm sure you've had birthday parties and you've had other events where you've gone and uh, maybe had a picnic this summer, uh, maybe a family reunion. And it's, uh, it's really great food. You get to be with your family. You might get to be with your friends. And it, it's just great. You get to go outside and play and do different things. Uh, I love getting together with groups of people. Um, Nebuchadnezzar in this morning's story throws a great big banquet. He's having a huge get together. Uh, but instead of praising God for all he had been given, he uh, had really turned into a very selfish, uh, very conceited person and thought he was the greatest there ever was. He just, he thought he was the goat, you know, the greatest of all time. And God wrote a message on the wall that said, you're not all that great. And tonight, your life is going to be demanded of you. You see, typically we don't know how long we're going to be alive. We don't know the number of our days. Uh, many of us will make it to older age and, and live a long, healthy life. Others um, are taken somewhat prematurely. We've all lost friends and family members who were, uh, who died too young. Um, maybe you've had a friend, somebody, uh, a playmate or a family member who uh, died young. Maybe they battled cancer or something. And we don't know when that is. So what our goal is, what our goal should be, is to glorify God every day we're alive. And then that any day, that God calls us to go home to be with him, we'll be ready. Uh, so it's, it's not a, a sadness, it's a joy that we've been given life. Let's live, live our lives in God's presence. Let's be grateful and thankful for the times that we've been given. But let's not forget when we celebrate that we're celebrating and glorifying God for all he's done for us. Let's pray. Lord, truly, all we've been given is a gift from you. You could have said, no, I'm not going to create that one. I know how he's going to turn out, and I'm not going to create her because she's not going to serve me the way I want. No, instead, you created us, and you gave us the option. You gave us the choice to be your hands and feet and to serve others or not. You gave us free will. Lord, I pray this morning that uh, youngsters watching online or, and those who are normally here, that um, they would understand that there's a God in heaven that truly loves them and has created them for a specific purpose. And that is to praise him and to be his hands and feet to serve and to be with others. Lord, I pray for all of us children of God, from the youngest to the oldest, that we might give you glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Our scripture this morning uh, comes from chapter 5 in Daniel, uh, loosely from verse 1 through verse 27. And again, I've kind of condensed this down so that it fits into our time frame. I would encourage you, though, to read it on your own in, in its entirety. King Belshazzar gave a great banquet for a thousand of his nobles and drank wine with them. While Belshazzar gave orders to bring in the gold and silver goblets that Nebuchadnezzar, 
his father had taken from the temple in Jerusalem so that the king and his nobles, his wives and his concubines might drink from them. As they drank, they praised the gods of gold and silver, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone. Suddenly, the fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the wall. The king watched the hand as it wrote. His face turned pale, and he was so frightened that his knees knocked together and his legs gave way. The king called out for the enchanters, astrologers, and diviners to be brought and said to these wise men of Babylon, Whoever reads this writing and tells me what it means will be clothed in purple and have a gold chain placed around his neck, and he will be made the third highest ruler in the kingdom. No one could read the writing or tell the king what it meant, so King Belshazzar became even more terrified, and his nobles were baffled. O king, the Most High God gave your father, Nebuchadnezzar, sovereignty and greatness and glory and splendor. But you, his son, O Belshazzar, have not humbled yourself, though you knew all of this. This is what these words mean. Meaning means God has numbered the days of your reign and brought it to an end. Tickle, you have been weighed on the scales and been found wanting. The word of God for the people of God and let us sing. No, we're not going to sing yet. We're going to watch a video. The year is 200 BC. Babylonians lead Israel into captivity. Those taken into captivity were forced to leave their culture behind. Most of us will never know that kind of oppression. Some do. What is the oppression of today? Politics, skin color, socioeconomic status, sexual identification. Please pray with me. Dear God, as we live, may we serve as we serve, may we love. And as we love, may we do so in your holy name and give you the glory. Lord, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts would be pleasing to you. Amen. Now, I always wondered what it meant, the handwritings on the wall. Well, now I know. Sometimes a, a message is clear and we get it. O other times... We need help interpreting a message. Sometimes somebody can look at it and say, well, that's obvious. Has anybody ever looked at you and said, well, duh. Yeah, I have that T-shirt. I'm surprised that God doesn't look at us and say, well, duh. It's obvious to me. He has to be thinking, how many times do I have to tell you or maybe he's up there saying, don't make me come down there. My name is Daniel. What Belshazzar and his guests did was a reproach to God. It was a slap. You see, it wasn't just his recent blasphemy with the holy vessels. Belshazzar had lived far away from God and led people in hedonism had been found wanting by God. However, there's much more to the story of Bel Belshazzar's sin. 
You see, the empire was being besieged by Assyria, and literally the kingdom was hanging by a thread. This banquet that Nebuchadnezzar threw had three purposes. First, it was to appease the gods, Nebuchadnezzar's gods. Second, it was a celebration. It was in anticipation of their victory over Assyria. And third, it was to pull all of the powers of all the gods of the countries that Babylon had conquered. Because if Babylon conquered a nation, then that god was then theirs. You see, God had, or Babylon had conquered Israel. So God was now under Nebuchadnezzar's power, or so he thought. We're all of having a bit of hubris, of thinking more highly of ourselves than we ought. General John Sedgwick has the notoriety of being the highest officer killed during the Civil War. He was reviewing his troops walking along the line and he, into a parapet, and he uh, stood up on this parapet looking out over the battlefield and his fellow soldiers, his fellow officers told him, do not do that, sir. All morning the Confederates have been taking pot shots at us and landing close by to us. And he said, nonsense. They couldn't hit an elephant at this distance. And he didn't get the word distance completely out before a Confederate fired a shot that hit him in the head and killed him instantly. You see, that's hubris. We can call it arrogance or pride, narcissism, but the result is the same. We, too, can be found wanting. This morning I want us to look at hubris in our relationship with God. I want us to consider that there's perfect timing and special symbolism in this message. And finally, I want us to interpret, to discern what the message is specifically for us today. So how can we have hubris in the face of God? Because we're Christian right? And in those two words, we're a Christian, I build my case. We might not be as much a narcissist as some of Hollywood's hottest celebrities or some of the athletes in our world today. We're not as arrogant and prideful as some politicians or others and not as self-promoting as, as many but I assure you that we're all guilty in some measure. I enjoy reading Greek mythology. I think it's really interesting. There's a character from Greek mythology, Narcissus. Narcissus was a hunter who fell in love with his own reflection. One day he was admiring his reflection in a pool and he bent down to kiss himself. Yeah, and he fell in and he drowned. Now, I don't think anyone here is in danger of being that narcissistic. I don't think we have that much hubris in us. I, but I think we're more clever than that. We're more subtle in our arrogance. But understand, we're all guilty. How many times do we carry the pretense that we're beyond reproach in our behavior? We're good people. I have respect for my elders. I give to organizations who take care of me. I give to my church. I, I don't, I'm not profane in my language. I'm a good person. We're really good. We are okay. You know, we serve a little bit. We have a coffee table, uh, study Bible. We don't 
always open it, but it's there. And our neighbors can see it when they come over. We try to not take God's name in vain. We show up somewhat regularly for Sunday service, and we don't cheat on our taxes. We don't gossip. Well, we don't really gossip. See, what we're doing is we share prayer concerns with others and say, hey, pray for my neighbor because he was doing this the other day. We don't, we don't spread gossip. We just, we have prayer concerns. We're not judging others. We're just worried about their soul, right? See, if we present ourselves as all in Christians, all in Christ followers, and we claim Jesus as Savior and Lord, understand that God has called us to a task. It's not like, okay, get in this line. Okay, now you're saved. Cool, we're good. No, you see, God has called us to a task and a passion and a purpose for which he created us. And I definitely believe in the Big Bang. I don't want you to think that I don't believe in science at all. I do believe in the Big Bang. I believe in a God that started the Big Bang, though. And I don't believe that he said, um, snap my fingers and then everything rolls into, no, it was with design, it was with thought. Each one of us were created not by a snap of a finger and by fortune or luck, but because God has a plan and we fit into his plan. Every atom, every atomic particle, every strand of DNA, and every being has a call and a purpose. Every. When we fail to respond, when we make excuses to be unavailable, when we seek cushiness over call, we're guilty of hubris. Guilty of hubris in the face of God. We're like Belshazzar, turning, taunting God's purpose for us. Those holy vessels that they were drinking wine from were for a specific purpose. Those were used by the Israelites to worship and praise God. We can't in one instance claim to be the hands and feet of Jesus and then in the next choose to serve him only in ways that feel good to us. In Paul's letter to the Galatians, chapter 6, verse 7, these words are written. Do not be deceived, God will not be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. And Belshazzar discovered that. So I, now I want us to take a look at the, the timing and some of the symbolism here. Kind of the, the back story, as Paul Harvey would say, now the rest of the story. If we go back to chapter 5, verses 13 and 14, we find this scenario. And then Daniel was brought before the king who spoke. So this is Nebuchadnezzar talking. Are you that Daniel from Judah that my father brought into captivity? I've heard of you. That the Spirit of God is in you and that light and understanding and excellent wisdom are found in you. If we expand this reading just a little bit and we look at verses 17 through 25, same chapter, Daniel recalls to Belshazzar that he was aware of all that God had done for his father, Nebuchadnezzar. And now it's Belshazzar's turn. How his pride had changed him. He had looked at everything that was given to him and he saw it as because he was somebody special. See, we're no one special more than another. We're all special in God's eyes, but not more special than another. Belshazzar was even more arrogant than his father Nebuchadnezzar. To me, this is the ultimate example of hubris in the face of God. Belshazzar knew Daniel, knew of his re, uh, reputation, knew his relationship with God, and that he had proven himself, and that God had proven himself. 
So what did he do? He became even more blasphemous than his father, and he taunted God. And I, I think we do that sometimes. We, uh, we pray to God for a, a solution to an issue that we're going through, job loss or family illness, um, someone has a brain disease or, you know, whatever it is. And because God doesn't answer it our way, it means that we know more than God. We're better than that. God's message to Belshazzar was a very pointed, sharp message. Here's more backstory. A severed hand was symbolic of a defeated enemy. In those days, casualties were counted on the battlefield. They would sever the right hand of a dead person, and then they would count them. That's how they knew how many were slain. Kind of gruesome, isn't it? In the story told in 1 Samuel chapter 5, verses 3 and 4, the Philistines captured the Ark of the Covenant, and they placed it. So they defeated Israel. They took the Ark of the Covenant, in which God had his presence, and they put it in the temple of their god, Dagon. They went to bed that night, and they woke up in the morning, and Dagon's statue had, been, uh, had fallen from its perch and was pretty much destroyed. And the face and the hands were missing from the statue. You see, hands were a symbol of defeat. So God is writing a message on a wall with a severed hand. God is saying, the God that you defeated, that you think you defeated, me, I am writing this message with my right hand. And it's about your judgment. This night you will be defeated and your life is mine. Our hubris, hubris and arrogance might seem like a small thing to us. After all, we aren't like Belshazzar. We don't do anything like that. We don't really chase after evil. And, and God is forgiving and he's full of mercy and grace, so we're okay. Even so, judgment is inescapable. God is all forgiving, but he also will not be mocked. Why wouldn't we want to pursue the, the specific purpose for which God has created us? I mean, that's our thing. If you have a passion, God has given you that passion. There's a purpose. Our third point is the judgment. And, and I shared part of it in the reading. Many, many, tickle, parson. Those are the four words that were written on the wall. It's Arama Aramaic in descending units of measure. And it's uh, weighed on the scales of Libra. Libra was a constellation that was just coming into the night sky in the area. Daniel told Belshazzar, Belshazzar, however you want to refer to that, um, that tonight your life will be taken because you've found, been found wanting. You've not measured up. Uh, September of 2015, so we're talking Seven years ago, I was preaching on a Saturday night in Reynoldsburg, and one of the church members came up, and he was really upset with me because I'd not been preaching on the coming, uh, second coming of Christ. I mean, September 18th, he's coming back, and you haven't been warning the people. And I could not get him to understand that no one knows, as Scripture shares, no one knows the day or hour, nor even the angels in heaven, nor the Son of Man, only the Father. 
be on guard, be alert. You do not know when that time will come. And that scripture is uh, from Mark 13, verse 32. I could not get him to understand that no one, not even Jesus Christ, knows that time. People will talk about Bible code. Well, if Jesus Christ is saying, hey, look, I don't know when that date is, then I'm pretty certain there's no Bible code. Because I think that Jesus would have that code kind of figured out. I couldn't get him to understand it doesn't matter about September 18th. We're supposed to be ready every day, every night, every hour. Daniel gave Belshazzar the exact time that God told him. But that's because God had told Daniel. We don't have that luxury. We don't know the time. We need to be ready every day. And it's not, I don't want you thinking that I'm ready all the time because I'm not. I, I, again, a reminder, I take this podium every Sunday as a sinner and that's the best I can do. Um, my salvation is in Christ. He is my purification. I remember as a kid that growing up on a school day, I could maybe sometimes con my mom into giving me five more minutes of sleep. I remember I could con my dad into giving me another half hour outside to play before I had to come in and, and get ready for bed. But at some time, there are no more second chances. There's, there's no extension. We, we can't tell God, well, can I just have five more minutes to get right? Can I have just another half hour to pray to you? Can I have uh, another day to work it out with my brother? Can I have... No. There will come a time when we all will be no more here on earth. We don't know that date. We don't know the date of the second coming. Arrogance causes us to think that we're good enough. I, I recently learned how to fence llamas. You know how to fence a llama? Anybody ever done anything like that here? Okay, you fence a llama by putting in a wire or a, a string or something right nose high, eyeball high. That's all that's needed. The reason is llamas aren't like goats. Goats will go over, around, through, over, you just, they'll jump a fence, it doesn't matter. Llamas refuse to move their head. They won't look up and they won't look down. They stay straight on. And I think sometimes we're more like llamas than we are goats. We refuse to look down or that's what we want to do. We want to look down on others. You ever met anyone like a llama? They won't lower their heads. They won't stoop down for anybody. God won't. So here's the thing about judgment. God will never ask you, so... If I could have given you or if I had given you X amount of money or X more time, what would you or could you have done with that? Instead, God will ask, what did you do with what I did give you? That's what we have to answer for. Belshazzar went on a uh, lavish building campaign. He built a, an entryway into the, into the uh, gate line. 20 lions, lions being a symbol of his kingship and his greatness. He celebrated his gods, Marduk, Ishtar, and several others, yet he was found lacking because he wouldn't worship the one true God. We don't need second chances. We don't need to look in the night sky and figure out if Libra, the constellation, is there. We don't need another five minutes. We don't need a half hour 
We just need to be ready. C.S. Lewis said it this way, a proud man is always looking down on others, and as long as you're looking down, you can't see what's above you. And I don't think that we look up enough. We could be like General Sedgwick. There's a world out there waiting to take pot shots at us. And we can think we're all that in a bag of chips and no one would ever do anything to us. We can be filled with pride and we don't want to take the advice of others. I know what I'm doing. You ever heard that? It's typically uh, younger speaking to older because I remember using those words to my dad. I know what I'm doing. The last great words of a person just before they really mess up big. I know that's, if you were to put the truth on a tombstone, I know there are a lot of them that would say, I know what I'm doing. Claiming to be a Christian does not give us salvation. We are not saved because we say, a Christian. Salvation comes in being a Christian. Salvation comes in claiming Christ as Savior and Lord and living that way. It's about an outflow of service that proves that we're all in Christ followers. See, we have to choose service over cushy, sacrifice over personal self-interest and focus. If we wait to see the writing on the wall, it's going to be too late. God did not come back. Jesus did not come back September 18th of 2015, nor any other September 15th since then. And since we just passed that, I mean, this is October 2nd. He didn't come back on the last one. I... I, we just need to be ready. We just need to claim Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord and love him and serve other people in his name. We just need to be ready. Here's the deal. We are saved in Jesus Christ. And our service, our love for others is a natural outflow of claiming Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. Amen. I want us to sing grace alone. Please join me.
Holy Spirit, we prepare our hearts to receive these gifts of body and blood of Jesus Christ. For us, it's a simple loaf of bread and in juice, but it represents something much more meaningful. We ask as you were there the evening that Jesus presented this sacrament to the disciples, you would be here for us, that you would fill these elements with your presence in the presence of Jesus Christ. Amen. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took a simple loaf of bread and special about it. He raised it to his Father in heaven and he blessed it, and then he made it special by saying, This is my body that's broken for you. Eat and be thankful. Likewise, at the end of the meal, he took uh, the cup of salvation. This was not an ordinary cup. It was ordinary wine that was in it, but the cup was special. It signified that the Savior had come. He lifted it to heaven. He blessed it, and then he told his friends, he said, this is my blood. This is a new covenant I give you for the forgiveness of sins of all mankind. Drink and remember. I want you to know that this is not a United Methodist table. This is not a Christian Endeavor table. But this is a table that's been prepared by Jesus Christ himself. He provides the nourishment for us. Come forward. And, and I watched Debbie this morning. She's used hand sanitizer on everything. She wore gloves and a mask. And everything is here for um, Take the cup. Peel back the top layer. And there's a wafer inside that is the, the bread for us and then peel back the next layer and you can get to the juice. But understand that Jesus Christ has prepared this for you. And when you come up, if there's a, a family relative that you're going to be seeing or a friend or a neighbor, and you want to take communion to him, have been blessed. And I want you to as many as you need um, and share communion with them. Please come as you're led.
of truth. But, uh, <clears throat> I want you to think about that confession this week. Should have done it before we had communion. This is a, there, there's so much truth in here. We think we're doing so well, but I would invite you to stand. Let's, let's say this confession, but think of the words in the this week, what we can do to be better. Please join me. Lord, we confess our day-to-day -day failures to be truly human. Lord, we confess to you. Lord, we confess that we often fail to love with all we have and are, often because we do not fully understand what loving means, often because we are afraid of risking ourselves. Lord, we confess to you. Lord, we cut ourselves off from each other and we erect barriers of division. Lord, we confess to you. Lord, we confess that by silence and ill-considered word, we have built up walls of prejudice. Lord, we confess that by selfishness and lack of sympathy, we've stifled generosity and left little time for others. Holy Spirit, speak to us. Help us listen to your word of forgiveness, for we are very deaf. Come fill this moment and free us from sin. Let's sing our closing hymn. I have to admit to you, there are times when I get a little smug and I feel pretty good about myself. And uh, then I'll walk past someone, I'll see someone on the street who lost an arm or a leg. They, they gave their um, 
arm or leg in the service of our country. I'll, I'll see a uh, teacher purchasing um, classroom items, and I know that she's doing that out of her pocket, typically. Um, there are so many people who give so much. Uh, I attended a, an Emmaus candlelight one weekend, and it, it was a candlelight service where people came from all over to tell these men and or women who are on the walk how important they are to them. And everyone would go around the room and announce where they're from, and there's the typical, yeah, I'm from Newark, I'm from Reynoldsburg, I'm from Pickerington, I came all the way from Columbus. And then someone said, I came from Detroit. There's someone who said, I came from Boston for this hour, and we're staying overnight, leaving in the morning, but we're going right back. I came for this moment. And we've had people all over the country just to share in that moment, to say, you're special. I'm wondering how we're doing in our visitations. I'm wondering to what extreme we would go to help someone out. How, how free are we? in our service. So this week, we all have an opportunity when we leave here. You're going out into the mission field. What are we going to do with that time? What are we going to do with the opportunity that we have to tell someone they're special? It's a clean slate. I just want to make sure that we're not so arrogant that we think we've already arrived. Uh, sep September 18th came and went. Jesus didn't come back this time, and who knows when it'll be. But let's, let's serve him faithfully, uh, happily, joyfully, and, and be ready anytime. Because I assure you, we're closer today than we were 4,000 years ago. It's going to happen. Let's be ready. Let's not be afraid of saying, oh, look. Here comes my Savior, not, uh-oh. We don't want to be like that, okay? Take advantage of those opportunities we have to be the hands and feet of Christ. Have a great week. Amen.